Hey, everybody on Zoom. We'll get started here in about uh, 20 seconds here. We just had an issue with YouTube, but we're going to be watching on Facebook Live. We're back to what we used to be a, a while ago. So get started here in about 20 seconds. Guys, you ready? Okay, so just want to welcome to everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. Uh, really excited to have Brian Eklund and Steve Thompson. Steve's a regular, his 10th appearance on the webinar series. So, um, you know, he's used to the, all the, the stuff with the webinar. So want to get right into it and um, go right ahead. I'll be here. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Everybody Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for joining us today. We've got Brian Eklund today. We're really excited. Uh, Brian has been with our Goalie Nation program since its inception in 2016 and currently sits as the Goalie Coach in Chief for Massachusetts. So Brian, thank you for all the help that you've had in kind of growing our program. I know a couple of weeks we did an overview of what Goalie Nation is and what our vision is and you've been a huge part of, of making this a realization. So thank you for that. No, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, this is something that I was you know, really fortunate a few years ago to be able to get involved with. Um, and when I got the phone call to be able to come out and be a part of Goalie Nation, it was really something that I, I had to jump on. And it's been something that has taught me a lot over the years. And it's something that I, I really relish um, all the time, like the opportunity to be able to get on these calls and be able to talk to other goalies. That's awesome. One thing, I mean, I met you within the last year really and got to know you. And the one thing that stood out was just your passion for goaltending and USA hockey. I mean, we sat there and talked at a coffee shop for an hour and I was just, it was just exuding goaltending passion and love. But what was really that started? I mean, you grew up in Braintree, Massachusetts. What gravitated you towards the crease and the pillows? Um, honestly, it's, it, it's an interesting one. Like my, my parents never played, they never really skated, but my uncles did. And uh, so growing up, I mean, we did have hockey in the family, but more than anything, my mother just wanted me to get out of the house in the winter. She wanted me to do something. So she signed me up for hockey, got out there and I fell in love with it. And uh, I played and my dad wanted me nothing to do with being a goaltender. Um, he knew nothing really about it. So he was, he was the, the guy that, that threw out that, well, you need to be the best skater on your team in order to be a goalie. So uh, I, I worked and I worked and, uh, um, I, I was kind of tireless. Like I went to power skating sessions, anything I could get my hands on when I was young in order to get on the ice. And my dad just kept driving me to the rink. And finally, I like, I was like a year or two later and he ended up uh, bringing me in and was like, all right, well, do you want to try being a goalie now? And I was like, absolutely. So uh, my, my cousin at the time that I didn't really know was a goalie. And he had this old like Cooper goalie glove that was like, like leather. And um, he ended up, my dad ended up meeting up with him and he was like, hey, well, you need a new one. Um, is there any chance that we could get the old one? And we were like, absolutely. So I get the thing and I bring it home and I think it's the coolest thing ever. I just remember smelling it, like the smell of that real leather. And I put it on my hand and I was like, wait a second. So I am a lefty, meaning naturally I am a lefty. I throw my left hand and baseball, I would catch with my right hand. The glove that I got caught with my left hand. So it was one of those situations where my dad was kind of like, well, it is what it is. So do you want to be a goalie or not? And I was like, yeah, well, hell yeah. heck yeah, I, I, I want to be a goalie. So I put it on my hand and, and jumped out there and started playing street hockey. And uh, my dad was like, all right, well, we're going to shoot some pucks at you. So lines up a bunch of pucks, fires a puck at me. I'm wearing this glove. That's all I got on. Hits me square in the face. Splits me open underneath my eye. And my dad, like, I go running in the house, screaming, crying. And my dad starts picking up all these pucks. And he's explaining the story to me probably a thousand times. And he's like, all right, well, that was the end of that experiment. You never have to worry about goaltending again. And I came running back, got blood coming down my cheek and had my hockey helmet on. And he was like, all right, I knew at that point there that you were tapped and this is what you want to be. Yeah, so, no. if that doesn't scare you away, nothing will, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's really interesting. So you've got, you know, you, when you played baseball, then I imagine you played baseball growing up as well. Would, would you yeah. then catch left because you played goal left or would you catch no. right? I, I would catch right. And it was, it was one of those things that I'd go back and forth where I'd catch hockey left and I would catch, catch um, baseball right. And I'd kind of flip flop back and forth. Um, I don't know if it was a good thing, a bad thing, but I mean, it, it was something that it was just what I did. 
And um, I mean, it, it, like I look at it now and I think it's kind of crazy. And I, I, I talk to a bunch of our young goalies that we have coming up that are, that are trying to figure out, am I a lefty catch or a righty catch and, and everything. And it, I mean, it just, it's one of those things that's, it's just, it was what I did. So, I mean, it, I really didn't have a choice. If I wanted to be a goalie, that was my only option. And there really wasn't a ton of right-handed catch gloves back then. So, I mean, I was, it was just what I wanted to do and I did it. What hand do you shoot when you play forward? Uh, I do shoot left. So it actually kind of worked the right way in the end. So it, I didn't have to then wor uh, worry about having to then trying to flip over and being able to shoot as well. So, I mean, that was a little bit on the natural side for me. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because that's actually been one of our visions for the future of goaltending is that, you know, if we have these athletes that are playing forward first and, and getting to play all the positions within the game and then growing towards goalie, similar to yourself when your dad was saying, hey, once you learn how to skate, you get the opportunity to play in net. Um, but our thoughts are, you know, if these kids are shooting right-handed as they're playing and developing as hockey players, why aren't they catching right? You know, and a lot of people just assume because of baseball will have a catch left and may as well be a goalie and catch left as well. But I think your story might actually hint on the fact that if maybe we have some natural right-handed shooters and we have them catching right, will our American goalies be better puck handlers than you know, the rest of the world for the first nation to jump and jumpstart this program? I mean, it's something that, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, you absolutely could look at it that way because it, like, trust me, learning how to catch with your offhand is a lot easier than learning how to shoot on your offhand. I mean, there, there's no question about that. I mean, and you see the struggle all the time when you're trying to work with a young goalie and the, the frustration level that they have right off the bat when they're, they're like, hey, you know what? All right, we're going to try to stick him a little bit. And next thing you know, you're looking at them and they, you can tell that they're right-handed and they're trying to do it lefty and it's very difficult for them. So, I mean, you're right. I mean, it might all of a sudden start bringing about a lot more puck handling goaltenders because of that. Yeah, I remember that was always a big, you know, I'd always tell myself because I was a righty as a player and then lefty as a goalie. And I would always, all right, when I play outdoor hockey, when I play street hockey, I'll play left so I can get better in goal. I'd play for like one shift and it was so bad. I would just throw the lefty stick in the trash and grab my righty again so I could compete with my friends. But, you know, if you give those kids the opportunity to play their strong side right off the bat, I'd imagine we'd have so many better puck handlers. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, we, we see it like, it's kind of funny. Like some of these goalies that, that, that I coach, they come down and they want to every once in a while work with the younger goalies and they get out there on the ice and they, it's a lot of them are right handed shot. And they, they, they play goaltender lefty, but they, they are right-handed shot naturally what they want to be. So when they get out there, it's like, oh, crap, I don't have right-handed sticks for you. I only have left-handed sticks. So it is, it is kind of funny that way. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, so you started there, and that was kind of what you got into it. And then you ended up going to Brown. Yep. And from there, had the opportunity in 2004, you got a Stanley Cup ring with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah. Can you explain that experience? Like, what a cool opportunity to be around that locker room and – I mean, that's everybody's dream in hockey. How was that? I mean, it's, I always look at it and I always say that I was the luckiest kid alive at that point. I mean, I really was. Um, I, well, coming out of Brown, um, there was a, a great goaltender that I was paired with my senior year uh, by the name of Jan Denis, um, a French Canadian kid. He was outstanding in college hockey and ended up having a good pro career as well. I mean, just a, like a great goaltender. And um, his senior, in my senior year, he ended up beating me off of the spot. So in a lot of ways, in my mind, I was like, you know what, my career is done. I got a degree from Brown. Like, I'm, I'm going to go and, and do something. And I got an opportunity where I got a phone call asking me to just go play pro hockey. And just for like the playoff run of the East Coast League. And I was like, absolutely. And I ended up getting to meet Carl Gehring. Um, I backed up Carl for uh, the playoff run. And um, it, it was one of those things that kind of sparked inside me. I'm like, man, this is a ton of fun. Like, I want to try it. And I was lucky I was drafted by Tampa. I was like a late, like seventh round pick. I, I mean, my claim to fame, honestly, is that I was probably like 10 picks after Henrik Lundqvist was picked, right? So I was, I was almost the same career path. Um, but he, uh, he it ended up being like one of those opportunities where I was at the right place at the right time. And I ended up getting there and being around them, um, being around that team and just being able to, see the uh, see the behind the scenes and how hard everybody works and how much fun and the passion those guys had it, it was just one of those things that i'll never forget and i mean being I, like in in an environment when you're in a game seven type situation we had i think two or three game seven situations during the course of that that playoff run it just 
it, just the the electric atmosphere. So it just it, inside you get so charged, like you want to be a part of it. And I was the third string goalie, and I just felt like I I remember sweating bullets during games. And I wasn't even involved in it, and just looking around and being a part of it. And when the cup came out, when we won it, it just like being down there, like on the ice level, seeing that happen. I mean, it's something that I mean I'll never forget. I mean, it, it's one of those things, and I have a lot of friends because of all of those situations. And I mean, I still bump into Chris Dingman and, and Marty St. Louis at the rinks, and we, we get to talk a little bit. But it, it's just such a one of those things that was at the right place at the right time, and it just was an awesome experience. I imagine being able to now coach and share some of those stories and the experience. What were some of the biggest takeaways you took from Hobby Bowl? And I just remember him you know, eyes shaking behind the mask on TV, yeah. you know, like that's, I remember watching that as a kid growing up, like what were some of the takeaways there? It, it, it's kind of funny. Like when, when I met him, um, I mean, I was in awe, obviously. I mean, like, like everybody is, yeah, but he was such a humble person, such a quiet person. Um, and just how hard he worked. Um, he worked ex like just tirelessly to the point where our goalie coach at the time, uh, Jeff Reese, he, he would actually have to tell Javi to get off the ice. Like, I mean, we're, we're in the playoff run and I'm the third, uh, third goalie there that's, that's helping out, trying to uh, cut down the workload that Javi has to go through. And he's just wanted to take rep after rep and go through all of that stuff. He just was tireless. And the thing that I like, I really pulled out of that experience of being around him and seeing that is that I, I think I work hard and I would think that I would work hard and I would look and say, but you know what? I don't work as hard as him. And if I want to ever be a person that could stay at this level, I need to take this all to another level. It's just like, and I know it sounds very um, metaphorical or whatever you want to use cliche, but it, it's just that if you're not willing to sacrifice that little extra more, you're not going to be able to reach that goal in the long run. And it just, it was one of those eye opening experiences. Yeah. What a fascinating opportunity that is. So from there, you know, you, you had a, a good pro career and then you got into coaching. At what point did you realize that you wanted to coach hockey and that was going to be the next step? Was that kind of a surprise to you or was that something you were always thinking about in the summers when you were training? Um, you know what? I never really thought about it. And I mean, like I got into it and I'll be honest, I was the arrogant hockey player, right? When I played and I thought, you know what? My next contract's coming right around the corner. So I need to stay in shape and I'm going to, I'm just going to try to get on the ice whatever way I can. So I had an opportunity to get out there and be able to work with some kids over that summer. And I was like, you know what? I need to stay in shape. So I'm going to wear all my equipment. I got on the ice and I do goalie drills and I'd call the other goalies down and they'd stand beside me. And I'd go through the drill, have somebody shoot at me. And then I'd say, Hey, all right, you get in the net and you go through the same pattern. But you know what? Yours didn't look like how I did it. So like try doing it like me and I'd hop back in and we'd just go back and forth. I didn't know a ton about coaching and trust me, like I get it now. And I didn't realize it then coaching and playing are very, very different. I mean, they have a very different feel. But I mean, it's one of those things that as I kind of went through it, um, I started learning about it. And I just remember that first summer I had this young man that was from Virginia that came down to, to work with me and he never really had a ton of coaching uh, in his background. And I, I got to work with him and he ended up making this junior team as a 14 year old. Um, and he was just ecstatic and how pumped he was. And he goes, you know what? It's all that hard work that we did during the summer. And I, I remember stopping and thinking, I'm like, man, like, did I actually make a difference? And it was one of those first moments that I was like, you know what, you can make such a difference. And I, and I remember back when I played and how I felt when I was going through my senior year and I felt like my career was over. And then I, I had somebody that, that instilled in me um, when I got to Tampa, that it was like, you can do this. And I felt that passion of like how much of a difference somebody can make by coaching you and taking that time. It was just one of those things that like, I kind of fell in love with. It fell into, into my lap, but I fell in love with just being able to help. And I mean, it's something that I never thought it would be a job, but I mean, it, it's something that you just keep going out there and you keep trying to help kids and they keep showing up. So, I mean, it, it worked out really well. That's awesome. And so you basically transitioned from pro, started at Harvard and yep. were there for three years and then now we're at BU. Yep. And in the process, you have Mass Creasy, so you work with local goalies in Massachusetts as well. And, and then obviously everything you've been doing for USA Hockey, so been very ingrained in, in the coaching world. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, 
it's been a great opportunity. I mean, I've been very lucky and very blessed along the way to have opportunities that, that, that presented themselves to me, like getting the opportunity to help out, uh, take the Nato's program over at Harvard. Um, LB O'Connell actually brought me in over there and gave me that opportunity to work with Steve Michalik, um, at the time. And it, it made it, it just like that opportunity. It, it just it brings passion out in you because you, you're like, you know what, this is a great opportunity to be able to work with these kids. And you see the other kids that are at that same level, that transitional level where they're, they're trying to get ready to play pro hockey. You're like, I was there. I know how that felt. And you, you want to get out there and help them. And it just, and then when I got the opportunity to work with David Quinn and LB O'Connell was over there at BU at the time. It was it was a no brainer to me. And just being able to work with that at the time, Jake Ottinger was coming in as a freshman, and getting to work with passionate, high level hockey players, it, it, it was it was a dream come true. I mean, it really has been a lot of fun being able to do it. Yeah, and I'm, I guarantee that's why you have the success you've had. It sounds so consistent with all the great coaches we've had. I mean, they love it, and, and just like the athletes. I mean, when you see a high end athlete, they love the game. They love being at the rink. It's just not a chore. They they found you know the joy in it. So. Pretty neat stuff. Now, as we talk about kind of your your approach to coaching, it kind of reminds me as we've talked over the years here, uh, Justin Goldman had a really great presentation, actually the very first one of this webinar series about creativity and coaching. And I know that's a thing you're always talking about is kind of experimentation and, and working with your goalies. What are some of the things that you've been applying in that realm with working with these high-end goalies you've had? Well, I mean, the thing that I really believe is that every kid's an individual, every goaltender is an individual. Um, you can't cookie cut an approach to goaltending. I mean, obviously every goalie has core concepts that they all need to master, but within that core concept, they have their own recipe to be the goalie that they are. Um, some will like to use RVH more and some will like to, to do certain things differently, whether it be on their, on their knees more or on their feet. And it's one of those things that it's a really cool experience being able to go through that with each kid and, or each goalie and be able to find their recipe and be able to like talk to them and have that conversation about what their recipe is. And I mean, it comes about different ways. Sometimes it, you get out there on the ice and you, you run through some drills and you start talking back and forth. Like, hey, what did you like about this? You know what, maybe, uh, maybe try it this way. And you kind of go back and forth off your own experiences. And then there's some conversations you have where a goalie is coming from playing from the national development program. And they've had a goalie coach for the last two, three years that have instilled a lot of things in their game. And they bring a lot of insight. So, I mean, it's... It's really a cool thing, um, but one of the other ways that we spent a, a ton of time working with our goalies on is we watch video, and we'll end up pulling all these video clips, and I mean, when you're at BU, every kid that walks through the door is dreaming of being a professional hockey player, so it, it's very easy to go and get these kids' attention when you go and pop on an NHL hockey game or pull, pull up an NHL goalie and you start talking hockey. So, I mean, it's, it's really a cool thing where you have like this passionate group and you get to kind of feed off of it. And it's kind of funny. Like I actually got a couple clips here that I actually used with um, a couple of our goalies. Um, and we kind of talked through them a little bit and I'll pull them up here and see if we can take a peek. All right. You guys see these? Yeah, we're good. Awesome. So, I mean, one of the things that that we would always do is like we would sit there and we'd watch a hockey game. We go on to NHL.com and you can watch NHL games from last night that have played in nine nine like minute segments. They break down some of the high, uh, highlight goals and, and shots and stuff. And we're able to sit there and kind of take a look at what these goaltenders do. And it, it's always funny, like it, it starts breeding a conversation, which is where we're kind of going today. And on this one here, we started watching like Marc-Andre Fleury um, and watching how these different goalies play different ways. And in this case, uh, in the conversation, we started talking about off the rush. And the thing that we kept noticing um, my freshman year at BU, so uh, my, no, I say my freshman year, uh, my, my first year coaching at BU, um, you start noticing like, certain plays happen in hockey East that wouldn't happen per se in ECAC hockey. And the one thing that we started noticing a lot of is um, a lot of depth to the rush. We'd have players that would be coming down the wall 
on an attack. And they would have these defensemen in these third, second and third layer of players that would be coming into the screen. And it really made it difficult for our goaltenders and how do they deal with these plays? So we started running through a bunch of clips. I'd watch a, a games with them and we'd start talking about how these different goalies play differently on the rush. And I mean, you can see Vasilevsky here versus Marc-Andre Fleury. Now we're looking at, all right, I believe this was Halak. No, this wasn't. Who was this? Can't even remember who this was at the time. It might have been Leonard, actually. And it kind of leads into um, taking a look at how our, we play as college uh, college goaltenders. So here in this case here, we had uh, Jake Ottinger was there my first couple of years. And we can kind of see how the similarities in the play on the rush and how we started trying to adapt and one person that he spent a ton of time watching was Andre Vasilevsky. So we started taking a look at how Vasi played. If you rewind back these plays to here, how Vasi played this play and how similar we wanted to try to start playing. All right. If you fast forward to now, Jake getting to play it all this time later. And we started finding these similarities in what he liked and what he didn't like. It might not have been something that I loved doing when I was playing, but just that conversation that you end up having with these goalies leads down a path where you start finding some really cool things that you can kind of work with. Yeah, it's so interesting. You watch Fleury, he's got so much motion and momentum as that play is developing. And then Vazzy's like, you know, pretty much static at the top of his crease. And then you watch Jake go and it's like a mirror image. He just changes the jersey, but it, it, same result. Exactly. And, and you know what, like with, with everything, I mean, when you're a goalie, um, everything that you do, you're going to gain something out of it. But at the same time, you're going to give something up. And it's one of those things that um, you got to be okay with what you're giving up on a situation. So when you become static and standing there at the top of that crease and that rush, you lose a lot of that ability to move laterally. So, I mean, it's one of those things that you're, you're willing to gain the fact that you're standing still and you're going to make yourself a big presence to the shot, but you're losing out on a lot of that lateral explosiveness. He just made the right read at, at that right time. Yeah. And if you look at, you know, flower the same way, right? Like that play ended up going to the short side and all of a sudden he has got the momentum to make that backdoor save. You know, you just hit the nail on the head. It was the read. Right. And it yeah. was probably what actually took place in the neutral zone and those different cues and probably through training the read instead of just patterns that allows that goalie to develop the confidence of that looks like a shot. I've seen this a million times. This doesn't look like a pass. This looks like a shot. I'm going to hold my depth. I'm going to trust my instincts. Absolutely. I mean, it's you kind of look at um, like with the way that like I try to coach is I try not to overcoach the goalies. I try to set up situations in front of them and not really talk them through, all right, this is how the play is going to progress and kind of let the hockey players be hockey players and let the play kind of dictate itself. And you'll see when, I mean, we've been very fortunate over the years at BU, you have players like Clayton Keller and Kiefer Bellows, and you'll have players like Dante Fabra, like the really high end hockey players. And when you tell them just be hockey players and go and do your thing, it's really cool seeing how that kind of turns into something different. Um, actually, no, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to think like how I want to kind of phrase it, but it, it, you can definitely see how like the patterns that, that you see through drills becomes really important. And I mean, like, like everything, like there are mistakes that happen and you can kind of train through those mistakes um, and you kind of learn what, where the goalie strengths and weaknesses are through a drill and just letting it organically come about. Um, it, it kind of leads me to like, I have some other clips here of goalies on situations that they, they kind of go through a pattern and you can see that the mistakes they were making when you were saying like in the neutral zone, mm -hmm. um, I can kind of pull these ones up, see if we can take a, take a little walk through them. And I tried to eliminate as many mistakes on the American side. So, yeah. So, I mean, this is one here. This is Peter Morozik. So this is a few years ago when he was in Detroit. And this is a clip that, that I, I used quite often over the years. And I mean, I get it. You have Alexander Ovechkin that's down here in the corner of the screen that's catching this puck and he's going to skate down the wall. And I mean, you have Alex Ovechkin coming down. You know he's going to blast this puck. So he comes walking down the wall. And just take a look at the positioning that Peter has on this play. He's out and extremely square to the puck, 
but at the same time, he's very, very, very ultra aggressive on the play. It ends up being a really hard shot that he couldn't really handle. And it ends up turning into like a, almost a scramble situation. So it's something that we started talking to the goalies about, like, how would you feel in this situation? Like, like, why do you think that he wanted to play that far out of his net in, in order to do something? And it's, it's one of those things where I look at it, it's like you gain something. Like, you know you have a very good chance of stopping this puck on Alex Ovechkin if you play out this aggressive. But if that rebound gets there, look at how hard of a play that turns into to try to catch up to that puck because of the depth that he had. So it's one of those things that in a drill where you could set it up and you have a player coming down the wing here and they blast away a shot, you let them organically find where they want to play to be able to make that save. And then as you set in and put in examples of like, hey, all right, we're going to have an extra player kind of hunt in this area. You can see how now how that decision has to change depending on the situation you see in front of you. So they have to make reads on that split second decision of what happens. Another one here that we that, that I kind of pulled up that we use quite often is Kari Price. I mean, Kari Price is one of the best goalies in the world. Um, and he does some amazing things, but it's always good to see that even some amazing goaltenders make mistakes. And you can see here, this is one that actually really stoked my mind trying to think of, all right, how could we do something differently? And we're looking at really good player coming with a ton of speed through the middle of the rink. And you can see Kari Price is already out at the top of his crease right now. Okay. And just kind of put the scout cam on Kari at this point and watch how much he has to work in order to make this save on this play. All right. It's not a ton of work, but the angle change, you have a guy cutting through the middle, coming down into the middle here. He has to move laterally across to be able to deal with this player here. Puck gets kicked out to the wide side, and then he has to move back across. Now, my question for you, Steve, is at what point do you feel that this is a true scoring chance? Like if he shoots this puck from right here, do you think if Kari Price is standing on the goal line, do you think he makes the save if he winds up and shoots from here? Yeah, and that's the interesting part about this is that both of these clips are within the first, you know, 30 seconds of the game. And I'm curious if these guys are just mentally like, so like, I got to be square. I got to be ready for every shot because it's, you know, this the puck just dropped and game's on. I'm curious if this happened later in the game, if they'd have a little bit more flow and confidence and trust and, you know, kind of reading instead of playing so direct on that shot. Because you know, it's, it's your a great question, point. To your question, I imagine, you know, anybody in the world could stop this shot from here just standing on their goal line with the amount Correct. of time they say they'd have to track the puck. And you look at with that, and Kari's out here at the top of the uh, top of the crease, and all of this extra motion because of it turns into a short side shot. And you can just see that he's lined up on the body of this player, and the left-handed shot just puts it inside that post. I mean, it's a great shot. And he probably comes up with this save more times than not. But at the same time, it's just that little extra work that he put in led to something crazy. Um, here's, here's one to your point a little later in the game on this play. All right. And this is Tuca. Just a completely different feel to this play. And I have it from a couple different angles because you can really see it from behind, but you can see how that's who, I mean, it's, he crosses the blue line and starts to work lat, which very underrated hockey play right here. Check this out okay. through his legs. Come on. All right, walks laterally. And I mean, at this point here, he's still not a true scoring threat in my mind. If he shoots and scores from right here, I mean, it's very unlikely it's going to happen. So he works and you can just see how Tuca, because he was out really far out and he came in and started cutting across the zone, Tuca had a hard time staying square to this play. And he started using that momentum skating backwards. I mean, it might've been because he was tired in the game or for different reasons. I mean, we see this in youth goalies a lot where they start using this backwards skating motion versus staying square. And it ends up costing him a goal. So, I mean, the thing that it made me stop and think, I mean, as the shot's being taken from right here, it made me think like, is there a different way to handle these plays on the rush? And it kind of like started that conversation with our goalies. And it kind of led into me ended up talking to some of my friends that are other goalie coaches. And 
it, it really was some cool way that we all were able to collaborate in, in, in coming up with something different, a different plan almost per se. So what was that plan and, and kind of describe the conversation you had and you know what led to this new vision of how we should read the rush and I'm sure there's many times you're sitting there going like if I only knew this when I was playing. Oh, it, it, it's crazy. It, exactly. I mean, you sit there and you think about like back to your game and how when you played 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago now for me, I mean, you sit there and you look at it, it's like, man, if I only knew this, maybe how much easier this game would have been. But that's kind of the cool part of goalie nation. It's like having these conversations, being able to sit with yourself and sit with the likes like Jared Wayman, Josh Robinson, like all of these like great minds and you start having conversations. And like this conversation actually went back and it was my goalie coach that I had when I was in Tampa and um, by the name of Jeff Reese, I ended up um, calling him and we were talking about just situations that, that my goalie was having trouble with. And we kind of bounced back and forth different ideas. And he was mentioning how his goalie that he had at the time, Ben Bishop, was trying things differently and how he was playing the rush different, differently and how effective it was being for him. And maybe it was something to try. And I was like, you know what, like, let's talk about this. And I just remembered I was actually on vacation. I was in Florida because it was over the Christmas break. And I was down in Florida and I was, I remember pacing around in bedroom being like, my God, like, could it be this simple? Like, I've got to like get on the ice right now and I want to try this and see how this actually worked out. So he ended up, uh, we ended up talking a ton about it. And I started like, obviously deep diving into Ben Bishop clips. And I was like, all right, what is Ben doing that's so different? And it, it was really cool that you could see that he was starting to feel the difference in these rush plays that they started seeing the layers to the rush and how he was trying to adapt to it. And it kind of like you, you looked at how some of the goalies were having trouble and you could see over time that they were kind of pulling all of a sudden, like this, this new way to play. And I don't even know if they were doing it on purpose, but it was, you could see them working through the problem. And it's, that's the thing that's great about like watching high level goalies, like watching these pro goalies is they're at the top of the game and you can learn so much from watching how their little nuances, little changes they make kind of trickles down into the youth hockey. And it, it's something that I, during deep, the deep dive sessions, it was one of these things where I, I started watching and I'll pull up some of the clips that I, that I ended up finding. And you can see here, this is a, a clip of behind Ben and I'll move this up out of the way. And um, it was a really cool angle that, that they had. I think it was on NBC. And you could see how the, the play ends up cutting through. And it reminded me a lot of the Barzel, uh, Barzell clip, where he kind of cut in and like attacked the middle of the zone with speed. And then he kicks this puck out wide. And the thing that I, I, I really admired with Bishop was how patient he was. He didn't come rocketing out and want to stand here at the top of the crease because he's not a threat yet. He wanted to stay deep and stay and stay uh, uh, compact. And after that puck was kicked out wide, he read the threat where it was coming from and he was able to step right out on it. I mean, we're talking a pass that's inside the blue line. And I just remember when I played, I was always told you, you want to be ready at red, right? You're going to step out when the puck crosses the red line. You've got to be ready. But the game is evolving so much in the neutral zone. All of these crisscrossing patterns and these passing plays that they make in the neutral zone. And it, it really has morphed into something different. And you can see how they crisscross here at the top of the blue and how little he had to move to be able to deal with that play. So I was like, you know what? Like that's, that's really interesting how he's being so patient on this play and how effective and how little he actually had to do. So it led into the next one. eventually there it is and i mean it, i started looking at flurry again and we saw flurry a little bit earlier on and how he was had a ton of motion going in in what he was doing and i just took a look at this clip and this was from this past season you look at him and how he's evolved from two years ago to this year this plays well inside the blue line it's a four on two and take a look at what point we see flurry come flying out on the angle he comes out now when the puck's at the tops of the circles to come out and step out on that angle. And then watch the difference between him carrying a lot of momentum backwards and what he does now. He starts settling himself down and he, you can tell he's got a great coach there and Dave Pryor. Um, 
he just holds his ground and he doesn't have that, that instant want to give up his depth. So it was just like you sat watching these goalies and you start having that conversation. This is one of my all time favorite Ben Bishop clips here is watch how this player comes in, cuts across the, the face off line right here. And you just watch what, how he reacts to this play. Just scout can Ben. Look where the puck is and how he played that cutting through the neutral zone. I mean, it ends up turning into a goal on a crazy, like broken play. But look at how patient he was cutting across the middle of the rink. And he's just sitting there waiting for something to turn into a scoring threat. You could just see the goalie IQ kind of just like oozing out in this, that he wasn't like thinking that I need to rock it out and try to be at like a super athletic on a play. He's able to stop and read and break down this play before it actually happens. And it turns into such simple footwork that he needs to use. That was just like, that is just such a cool clip. Um, again, just another, another kind of example of that wide kick. So it enters through the middle. Uh, one of my good friends here, Jordan Greenway, cuts through the middle, kicks it out wide to be you kid. Leaves it there for him. And you could just see Flurry come flying out on this play on the angle. He wasn't already out there at the top of the crease. He came out the last second, flew out there on that angle. Let me see the celebrations. You can see him rock it out, get himself set. And it just a broken play again ends up leading into a goal. But I mean, it's just one of those things that you just see how they're, they're, they're evolving. The goalies are evolving in front of your eyes. And it, it's just really, really cool to see it. And that kind of led to, um, and there's one other American goalie that I noticed that did it, um, Garrett Sparks. During the playoffs here a couple of years ago in the AHL, he had this one clip where the puck got kicked out wide and you could just see him coming out on that angle. It's like, this is just something that's brilliant. Um, and it made me really start thinking like, this is something that I could probably bring now to my goalies and how can I start teaching this to our goalies? And like, maybe this patience is going to be something that would work really well for my goalies and maybe start improving some things. Yeah. And, and this whole thing just makes me think of what the fight that we're always fighting as coaches and as goalies. And that's the urge to do things the way that they've always been done. And when you think about how linear the game used to be, and even like if we think of goals from the 80s, the 70s, how often was it just a player coming in the blue line, taking a slap shot from the half wall or the blue line? And that was a legitimate threat. I mean, the equipment was different and the game was different. And, and there was a lot of goals that were scored. I just picture Gretzky walking in across the blue and taking a slap shot and the puck going in the net. And so I imagine, you know, the way things used to be done, it was, it was to your advantage to get out quick and be prepared for that linear play and make sure you take away all the net and, and give yourself the best opportunity to force that player not to shoot. But to your point, the game's different now. You know, are we really handicapping, you know, handicapping ourselves by getting out too far? And as you know, you know, the further out in your net you get, the more variability there is in your angle and your squareness. And you're just, you're really making this a lot harder on yourself than you need to. It's pretty interesting to see those goalies adapt. And then to yourself as a coach, not getting so stuck in your ways and going, what are you doing? Why aren't you at the top of your crease when the puck's at the red line? Like, that's what we told you you have to do. I mean, it, it's one thing that I, that I can say. If you want to be um, a really good coach, you can't, you've got to check your ego at the door. And I mean, it's, it's something that there are so many people out there that I felt like I've learned a ton from so many different conversations. I mean, it's something that, that like out of this whole virus that's happening right now and how everything has changed the world. The one thing that, that I look at that I, that I miss dearly is being able to go out there and to some of these meetings, whether it be in Buffalo or wherever it is at the USA things, where you get to sit in a room with all of these goalie coaches and start talking shop. You start talking hockey and like little things that they've tried and what they've been doing. Every time I, I, I get around other goalie coaches, I feel like I, I become a better coach myself somehow, some way. Like I try to take something from it. And it, it's one of those things that I think that the more that, that we are open books and we, we share those type of ideas, the more we're going to keep pushing goaltending forward and, and trying different things. Now, I mean, this is something that worked um, you know, like for Ben Bishop and it's working for Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, but would it work for my goalie was like the next real question. Like, well, how would that, that go? And it's kind of funny. Like, even when you look within it, it's, I did have one goalie that really loved it and he ended up adapting and using it. And then I had another goalie that really did not like it. It was, he felt very uncomfortable in the situation with it. 
So even within that, you, you have to be variable and say, hey, as much as I believe in this, you sometimes have to understand like, hey, the athlete at the end of the day has to feel comfortable with what they're doing, that you can kind of lead them down a path, but you have to be willing to avert and go a different way if, if it just isn't working. So, I mean, it, it's something that um, it, it's really, really cool to have those type of conversations and see how things go. And I think the big point that you've made multiple times throughout today and is how player centered your coaching is. It sounds like a lot of the learning that's going on is based on questions and you're almost, it seems like learning more from your athletes than you feel that they're learning from you. And it's just, what did you see? You know, how did you feel? What would you do differently? Why did you act that way on that rush versus that rush? What are some of the conversations like when you're sharing these clips with your athletes? Oh, I mean, it, it, you're, you're dead on. It's the conversations end up going so many different directions with it, but it's, it's one of those things that I never try to be the person that tells you how to play hockey. It's your individual experience that's in that net. And I mean, even on a goal that's giving up or you look at it, it's like, how did that goal just go in? and everything you go in there with with uh, like I try to go in with the mindset of what did you see how did you feel on that play how did you feel after the play was over like how could we have approached it differently and ask those questions and you hit the nail on the head I feel like I'm learning and, and as much as I mean way more than I'm actually imparting out there and I think that it's kind of like a really cool part of uh, of coaching is that it almost feels like you're organically having the goalie coach himself you're leading them down a path and by asking them questions in which they're finding who they are as a goalie through answering those questions um it's never something that i, I do like i try to do it's just something that i've always i've always wanted to like the, the feel like like i'm in their skin i mean like i always kind of look at it as i'm behind the bars and what would i have seen how would i have done it differently but at the same time i'm not arrogant into thinking that i'm that same goalie i'm i'm six foot five maybe the goalie that that is in the net in that situation is only five ten maybe they're six eight they're going to have different things that they can do and that they feel comfortable with so it's always about like trying to have that conversation with them it almost sounds like you're a professional best friend you just you're, you're there yeah. you know like you're not really their coach you're just there to be there for them you, you hear them out you, you you talk to them about what's going on and you kind of let that learning happen by being there for them and focusing and caring about their development. Yeah. I mean, you, it becomes a relationship. I mean, and it's a, it's a two, two way street. I mean, you go in there and you try to do everything you can, you get there, you set up drills, you set up situations. I mean, I wouldn't even call it a drill. I mean, it's more of a, you set up a situation for these goalies that kind of learn to work their way through. And I mean, and you like almost like share that experience with them all the way through it. So, I mean, you're, you're definitely dead on like that. That is exactly how I kind of feel when you're going through it. And that kind of leads me to my next question is now the application part is, you know, how do we, how do we now teach this? What does a reading the rush drill look like if you're on the ice with Brian Eklund? Okay. Um, I mean, I can go back to when I tried to teach it. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I have the ability to. Sure. I do. All right. Well, let's, let's give this a shot and see how it goes. All right. Um, I got all the scribbles on here, so let's see how this goes. All right. So what I did when I was at BU, um, when we first started trying to adapt this and we were like, you know what, let's give this a shot. I remember it was right after Christmas break. I got back from Florida and I was like, we gotta, we gotta get going with this. We gotta give it a shot. And I just remember like, how do you teach this? Like, how do you get kids to, want to be patient and try this. Um, and one of the things that, that you're resetting on them is when they step out, they got to get comfortable with not a attacking out to the top of the crease. Um, when the puck crosses the red line at, on the rush, you have to like get them more comfortable when the puck is closer to them. So what I ended up doing, if we take a top down view of the rink and we'll, we'll kind of put the crease right here and we'll have the blue line going across. All right, what I ended up doing was I set up three sets of pucks. I put a set of pucks here, a set of pucks here, and a set of pucks here. And I'm very lucky at BU that we have players that love coming out to shoot and they love uh, being a part of this. And what we ended up doing is I asked our goalie to stand here on the goal line. He just stood there standing still. And one of these three goalies, all right, one of these three sets of players would, would be set to go. And it would be random. They would get to pick who got to go on this play. And they'd have a puck on their stick and that person would then 
take off and come at the net without letting the goalie know who's coming. And they would take two, three strides in and wind up and take the hardest shot they could possibly take. All right. It started like that. And I just told them, Hey, please don't hit my goalie in the head. And I would stand off here on the corner and, and dive out of the way when the puck went around the glass and crazy this. But you would stand here and he had to sit there and read all three of them, keep an eye on all three different lanes. And then at any given moment, somebody was going to take two strides and take a, take a bomb of a shot. So the goalie then would have to rock it out to the top of the crease, get their feet set and be able to make that save. And they started gaining this confidence that I can get out there quick enough to get my depth that I needed in order to handle this play. And after that kind of went and it, it really did well after a little bit, um, what we ended up doing was we kind of made a small change. We turned it into a two on out where maybe this would be player one and this would be player two. They would randomly pick who would be the two. Maybe it would be this guy here would carry the puck and this guy over here would be the, would be the second guy coming. And they would vary it up in different situations. And he would have to diagnose the play that was in front of him from the blue line in. Essentially, it was what ended up happening. It could be a two on zero, oh, a two on one, and we did all these different like kind of variations on the same setup. And then once he got really comfortable with this setup, we moved all the lines into here. We moved them in even further towards the tops of the circles, and we just kept creeping in closer and closer to when he felt no longer comfortable, just could not handle it anymore because it was just too close at that point. And he started organically figuring out like, hey. I can still get there and I can still be comfortable with attacking out later. Um, and they were able to then start adapting that into practice where, you know what, maybe I, on all these rush plays that we're, have, we're taking in practice, I don't have to step out. And the thing that we found, and this is something that I did not expect at all when I was having a conversation with him, um, was how locked in on the puck you become. When you step out off that goal line on the rush and you set your feet, um, after you were tapped out, you get so puck focused at that point because you're out there on the angle and you're trying to move with the puck laterally, left and right, if the play is going left and right, that you, all of the other players around you become hazy. By staying back on the goal line, you're almost forcing yourself to have to diagnose all the players that are around you in front of you. So the thing that they kept saying in party, and they kept saying is, I just feel like I can see so much more. That was like the quote I kept getting back is that I feel like I could see what was going on in front of me. more, And it, it just really like, I never really thought of it that way, but it's, you just started learning through them and their experiences and what they give back to you. And, and that's where that relationship becomes important. Like, having that trust where they, they can tell you how they feel and you being able to then, then turn around and say, Hey, let's try this. And then trusting that you're not trying to mess them up and trying all these, these crazy things. And then having that relationship to go back, it's it just, it was just one of those really cool moments where you start working through a problem with these kids together and you start coming to that solution and then how they gain confidence with that. It's just such a cool thing at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, it, what I'm picturing through this is like on a true rush, if you give yourself just that larger plane of view and that extra split second of being able to read the rush, does that give you the ability to really see that player commit to going to the back door and initiate you to get a little more motion? Or do you see that guy start to veer towards the center of the rink and now you hold your ground a little more because he's no longer taking himself into the play? And are we eliminating our opportunity to see that play develop because we get so puck centered on entry that we erase the rest of the game? And, and again, I, we can't hit this point enough. I mean, we, with the analytics of the game, you know, the whole golden road and we got to get the puck across the ice to make the goalies move, you know, was that the adaptation the forwards made to us playing a linear style of goaltending? And now as our job as goaltenders to move our pawn and play chess as well. And now we've got to adapt to the read that they made. And that's really the way that I see goaltending. It's us versus the forwards. They make a decision based on our body and mechanics. And we better act because if we continue to play the way it always was played, you know, they're just going to expose our deficiencies. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, you look at how the game is evolving nonstop. I mean, uh, we, in the last couple of years, the RVH became a prevalent technique and it, it was a great tool for us to be able to use. But now you're starting to all of a sudden see the players. They're starting to learn what we're doing and how they're starting to change what they're trying to do. You're seeing a lot more plays from, from the goal line, them trying to aim high at our head. Um, like it's, it's happening. So we now have to adapt a little bit more again. And you can see 
that we're trying now to stay on our feet more. It's you, it just every step of the way, you're right. It's like a chess match. The pawn gets moved a little bit to the left. We now have to counter it. And for years, we were the ones that kind of set the pawn. We put our pawn where we want and all the players had to react to us. And it's now all of a sudden they're catching up. They are getting their better coach than they ever have been. And they're starting to analyze goaltenders as much as we analyze players. And you sit there and it's, it's almost like you feel like, I mean, I sit next to skills coaches at youth hockey practices all the time. And it ends up almost feeling like, all right, what are you trying to do today? All right, now I have to now counteract what you're doing because I now know these players are going to start trying to do this. And it's like you play that back and forth. But I mean, that's, that's what's making this sport so awesome. I mean, it really is. It is a sport that isn't like so static where it's pitcher versus batter. and We stand there and we swing. I mean, I, I love baseball. But it's just, this game is just so free flowing in motion at all times that it's just so much that can happen in ad lib. It, it, it's awesome. And I think there's a challenge that comes with that as well. I mean, there is so much variance to our game that we need to be very mindful of the way that we teach it and the way that we practice and apply these. Because I think that, you know, the, the challenge that we now face as goalie coaches and goalies is does practice look like a game? We know the game's free flowing, we know there's so many variables, we know that nothing really looks the same. So do our practices and do our drills mirror that? And I think one thing that you've shown, and I think a lot of our IN goalie coaches have shown is you end up coaching the, the shooters more than you coach the goalies. You're really directing those shooters as, you know, I really want to see them read on a quick attack off the rush. So the goalie doesn't know this, but the shooters do. And then you're like, all right, that's gone a few times. Now attack the back door. Let's see if they adjust and make that play to gain some motion and give up some depth. But really what you're doing is you're almost becoming like a, a puppeteer of the shooters to change the environment for the goalies. And the goalies are just playing hockey. They're, they're blind to this situation. There's no patterns. There's no, he's going to carry it in, walk across the top of the circles and shoot it low to your blocker side. And the goalie's like, all right, well, I know all the answers now. So I'm just going to stay on angle and control the puck to the corner. Have, how has that changed? I imagine like you were taught that way where everything was pattern based. You probably started coaching that way. How has that change been for you now managing the shooters more and then looking to the goalies to say, what do you think? Well, how's it been? Oh, exactly. I mean, you, it's, you, you look at even some of the goalies that we have now. I mean, like even some of the high end goalies, you go out there for a goalie ski and like they'll shoot and we'll say, all right, we're going to do a timing drill at the beginning just to get you warmed up. And you'll do a drill where you make a pass over or, all right, you're supposed to wait till the goalie sets his feet and then a shot comes. Mm -hmm. And then inevitably, one of the players eventually wants to score a goal and he shoots the puck early. And then the goalie is like, oh, what was that? Like, that's not the drill. And it's like, time out. This is hockey. Things are going to happen. You're going to have to adapt to that. And it's it's that mindset that, that kind of goes with it. I mean, it's something that I look back when I was a kid. And I just remember when I was growing up, I'd go down to the rink and the only goalie coaching that we really had in, in the south of Boston area um, when I grew up was um, a puck shooting, Zamboni puck shooting machine, a guy walking out in Wolverine work boots and had a Budweiser can in one hand and he filled the thing up and just started ripping them as hard as you could. And if you started making saves, you just turned the dial up a little bit more and started ripping them a little bit harder. That was goalie coaching back then. And I mean, that, that leads to that static, all right, I'm going to stand right here and just get blasted away at. Bringing back um, some threes for Dave right now. <laughs> and it, 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 it's, it's one of those things that it's like, you look at now and, and how these goalies are, are, are coming up and they've had such a different upbringing of how the game is played that you can just see naturally the game's evolved from that position. It's just like, it's no, no longer even the same game from 20 years ago. Like when I was, when I was younger to what it is now, I mean, even in college, I mean, I had a great friend that was a goalie coach and I would call him my friend. He wasn't a person that was an X and O's goalie coach that really taught you how to do a butterfly slide or um, like an on ice recovery or anything like that. He was a guy that would sit there that you could talk to. It wasn't until I turned pro that I really had somebody that could actually teach me how to be a goalie and, or excuse me, that the finer art to being a goalie. And it's something that these kids, they, they start now at eight, nine years old. They're already being taught a lot of these things. It's just a whole different ball game for a lot of these kids uh, from them growing up. Dave, I know you've been tracking the questions through uh, Zoom and YouTube. Are there any questions on there that have been? 
jump in? Nope. Uh, no questions right now, but uh, I, I, I have one question for you, Brian. Yeah. When you are coaching these goalies and they say, hey, that wasn't the drill, okay? How do you not just say, hey, it's hockey? How do you really let them know of why this is important? Well, I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, obviously, they're frustrated in the moment because, like, that's their first reaction is, all right, uh, like, I want a drill. I want it set up a certain way. And then I want that drill followed through all the way to the end. And it, it's one of those things that, like, I always go up to them and explain to them, like, hey, like, you've made 10 saves in a row. They want to score a goal. All right. That's what hockey players are. And if they don't ever score goals, they don't ever come back on the ice. So at the end of the day, they're going to go and pick and choose their moments where they're just going to say, I'm going to score a goal now. And it's one of those things that as a goalie, if you're not anticipating that that's where it's going to go, like, hey, you're going to have to wake up here a little bit. This is the way that this game is. We're helping them, but they're also helping us. So it's a back and forth here. And I mean, we try to set up competitions throughout the, the practice. And it's kind of cool. Like it, it happens usually at the beginning of the season. You'll see the goalie get frustrated and be like, why, why is this happening? And then as the season goes, it's almost like those moments that they kind of relish. Like that's where they get to like to reach back and make the big windmill glove save because the person shot so early and go for it. Or they airmail dive for a puck in order to make that save. And it becomes that competition between the players and the goalie. So it ends up really livening the whole thing up. So it, it usually starts a little bit rough. And then as the season goes, they kind of learn that that's part of the battle. Yeah, and I think that's the case. I know I was one of those goalies that used to get mad at the shooters. So, you know, like, <laughs> Don't we all. You're doing yeah. this wrong. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. You're scoring on me. That's yeah. not, <laughs> I got a lot of those. Um, Coach Luke asked a question about um, training younger goalies and how right now everything is right or wrong a lot in their world. But, you know, asking those questions and having, I know you touched a little bit on the perceiving it from their point of view. How do you really, let those youth goalies discover and explore on their own? Um, I mean, like, obviously with youth goalies, you're spending a lot of time trying to build that skill set up and you're trying to teach them how to do certain things. And I think that the important thing that you, whenever you're introducing a skill set is to introduce the why or when type question to them and try to like almost ask them, all right, we're going to do this skill and we're going to work on lateral release. All right. And this is how we're going to go about doing it. Now, can you picture a time in a game when we would use this? All right. All right. This is a situation. All right. Now let's try to set that up in our mind. All right. Who made the pass? Where did the pass go to? All right. Now, why would you use it here and not use something else and ask the questions of them. And I know it eats up time and you probably eats up a few reps here and there that the kids probably could use. But at the same time, it's almost like getting them in their mind to be like, why would I ingraining in that skill that they're developing to why am I using this skill versus just, hey, all right, this is what I'm supposed to do. I still don't understand when I use it. Um, I think that that's an important thing that you always want to have is just that, that time where you can ask the questions of them like, hey, like, why would you why would you use a butterfly slide here and not use a lateral release? Why? What are the benefits and the negatives to both sides of that? And then how often do you use video with those goalies? Um, we, we try to use it at least once a week. Um, so we'd have with youth goalies, um, whether it be we, we kind of take the same tack that we do with the college uh, goalies, where we'll take video of NHL goalies. And I mean, we blast out a video in which I can annotate on it and be able to say, hey, this is something that we're seeing that an NHL goalie is doing or the players are trying to do. And we, we try to maybe do that once a month but um, once or twice a month. But then we also have video and we have like iPads we try to set up and occasionally you catch something and you catch something both like something like amazing or something that they need to work on. And you try to get them to see themselves. So they almost like they get that, that feel of, I just did something and I know how it felt. And then they get to turn around and look at it from my perspective at that same thing. And you're like, all right, now I see how that it actually is. So it, it's kind of cool. Um, seeing like from both sides of the perspective, they almost become a goalie coach of themselves. Yeah, and th that's a really good. We uh, had a, a like a chat with uh, a coach out of Ireland. He was talking about having the players coach themselves, essentially, and that's what you're trying to work towards, which is yeah. very interesting. And um, 
you know, and having that language and talking amongst themselves and coaching themselves. So, um, Steve, uh, we're out of time, like always with our, uh, but I want to give you two, uh, just maybe a minute to say if you have any last words or anything that you want to tell the audience or, you know, say how good Steve Stash is, anything like that. <laughs> Man, yeah. never shave it. Never shave it, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, for me, I mean, a couple of huge takeaways for me today were, one, your playing career. I mean, how easy would it have been your senior year to say, you know what, I lost my job, that guy's a good goalie, and, uh, you know, it's been a career. And you stuck with it, and you had the opportunity to be a part of a Stanley Cup champion team. And I just, that story can, can so many of us listening can resonate with that story. And I, I just really love that that's something we can highlight today for, for those athletes that are down on their luck and are thinking, the game's over from I was the backup this year in junior I'm never going to play college hockey or you know what I didn't play in college I better give up and you know what an awesome opportunity that when you stick with it this sport really becomes a war of attrition and it becomes about passion and if you love the game still and you're willing to believe in yourself and keep working like what a cool opportunity came for you through that no I mean so, it's there's no question it's it, this game is it's tough I mean it's a mental grind um I mean I I, I don't love talking in cliches, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, you need to have a lot of confidence in yourself and, and over, over time, you're going to build that up and it's going to get broken down. It's going to be rebuilt back up. And one of the things that along the way, if you lose that confidence in yourself, you're going to lose your way. Um, just keep being passionate about what you're doing. And if you believe in yourself, then the opportunity is there. I mean, I was told, many times that you would, you're not good enough. You're not going to make it. And I just kept trying. I kept working and I kept trying to do whatever I could make that next save. And I, I can say that, that, that there is a good shot. And like, if you have the passion and you have the work ethic for it, you can also achieve what you want. I mean, it's just a matter of being at the right place, the right time. And there's a lot of luck to it, but have fun with it. I mean, it's like something that I, I always look back at and I, I wish I, I took a little bit more time to appreciate what, we, what the situations that, that we were going through. And I look at it now that I'm very fortunate to be able to still live through all of these other goaltenders and live through them and see how they're going through it as well and, and keeping a, a part of the game from that perspective. Well, this has been fantastic. I'm excited to see what Goalie Nation does with this information and some of the creative new drills we start to see popping up. So, Brian, thanks again for sharing that with us today. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great job, everybody. And uh, we'll see everybody on the next USA Hockey webinar series tomorrow. This would be Friday. And, um, Brian, Steve, great job, both of you. And two great guys, you know. So, awesome job. <laughs> Three great guys, Dave, three. <laughs>